Well, hopefully uh, you've turned to the book of Ephesians. Now, if you're new to Calvary today, one of the things that you'll find about us is that we take books of the Bible, we start in the beginning of the book, and we will teach our way through the book. So we've been working our way through the book of Ephesians on Sunday morning, and we've come to Ephesians chapter five. And uh, so we started last week, and we came to um, a certain part in Ephesians chapter five, and I mentioned I wanted to uh, piggyback on that this week and just take it one step further. So we're gonna do that today. I also think it's interesting on this particular on this particular teaching is in that we are uh, a couple of weeks away from Christmas and we're a couple of weeks away from beginning the new year. And I don't know how it's been for you, but this year has gone by so fast in in my life. And uh, so, but but one of the things about me is that um, when I come to the end of the year, I become very introspective. And I, I take the last couple of weeks of the year and I will begin to journal and I'll write and I'll, I'll look back at the, the past year and I'll evaluate and then I look at the coming year and I make some decisions. You know, what did I get right? What do I need to adjust going forward? Because I, I want next year to be more effective than, than this year. And so I, I thought in the midst of this busy season that we would take a couple of minutes just to consider some thoughts and it's not gonna, it's just gonna be some, some thoughts today. For some of us, this is going to be by way of reminder, and for some of us, this, this might be new. But uh, there's an illustration that has had a profound effect in my life and in Cheryl's life, and it's, it's a profound effect in, in, our, in our marriage and in our family, and it has become uh, the, the uh, metaphor, you might say, for how we live our lives. And so um, I'm going to tell this story. The story is told of a, of a time management uh, teacher. Um, so I'm, I'm going to do the, the illustration here. They have found a much older looking gen- gentleman to <laughs> assist on the screen. He's over there too. (laughs) I don't know how it is for you, but I look in the mirror and I go, you still got it. (laughs) But I see a picture and I'm like, Cheryl, call assisted living. (laughs) Have you had that experience? Well, if you haven't, you will. So. So the teacher in time management stood before a a group of young energetic business executives and he placed in front of them a jar just like this. And uh, he began to put rocks in the jar. One rock, two rocks. Did it kind of slow in order to uh, get everybody's attention. And then three rocks and then four rocks and then five rocks, and he turned to the class and he said, is it full? To which people said, yeah, you can't get any more of those rocks inside of there. And he says, well, let's, let's find out. So he reached down and he pulled out another vase here and had some smaller rocks and he began to pour those rocks into the jar. And then he looked at the class and he said, is it full now? To which they were kind of on to him and they said, well, probably not. And he said, well, let's find out. So he pulled out a jug of sand and he began to pour the sand into the jar. Is it going down in the front? Okay, all right. So he poured that in. Just like that, and I'll let that go there. You get the idea. And of course he said, well, is it it full now? And uh, nobody wanted to answer. They were a little bit nervous. So he said, well, let's find out. So then he pulls out a jug of water. And in the jug of water, he just begins to pour that in. There it goes. And it began to fill up 
just like that. To which he then turned to the class and he said, is it full now? They were afraid to answer, but yes, it's, it's full now, it's full now. And then he turned to the class and he said, so what's the moral of the story? To which one young energetic business executive said, no matter how busy you are, he's teaching on time management, no matter how busy you are, you can always get more in. <laughs> to which he said, no, no, you've missed the point. The point isn't that you can always get more in. The point is simply this. If you don't put the big rocks in first, they're not going to go in at all. You gotta put the big rocks in first. So he began to explain that the big rocks represent the important things in life, the big rocks, the big things in life. And if you don't put those things in first, they're not gonna go in at all. So for Cheryl and I, this has become a metaphor for how we live life. You know, many people go through life and they don't decide up front what the big rocks are going to be in their life and then make a conscious decision to make sure that those things go in first. And so we look, we look on at the world and we see marriages disintegrating, children rebelling and families falling apart. And uh, we realize that, that for many people, although they've done life, they never decided what the important things are, the big rocks, and they didn't put those things in first. So if you were to come over to our house, and just to show you how important this metaphor is, if you were to come over to our house on the, on the um, next to our table, there's gonna be a picture, there it is. Uh, we have this jar, and we call that the big rocks. And uh, the big rocks are there to remind us that if we're going to live life effectively, we have to put the big rocks in first. So we're constantly asking, are we putting the big rocks in first? So this is, again, has become the metaphor for how we do life. So I, I thought that as this year comes to a close and we come to the beginning of a new year, that maybe we would take a few minutes today and consider and then maybe evaluate and uh, make sure that we're putting the big rocks, the important things into our life first. Because if we don't put those things in first, first, they'll never get into, into our lives. So we're gonna call this the big rocks. So as a metaphor for life, a couple of things that we're going to notice, this is not on your outline, but uh, did you notice that I could only get six rocks in there? Uh, the truth is you can't get 10 or 15 or 30 big rocks in your life, important things. You might be able to get six, seven, maybe eight, but you can't get 15. There's not that many big rocks and you don't have enough space in your life for that many. The other thing that I hope that you noticed is that the rocks didn't get in there by themselves. I had to intentionally put those in. They don't just hop in by themselves. It doesn't just happen. So to get the big rocks in my life, the important things, I'm going to have to decide what the important things are, the big rocks in my life, and I'm going to have to intentionally decide to put those things in first because if they don't go in first, it's gonna fill up with everything else and they're not gonna get in there at all. Sadly, again, most people never decide what the big rocks are in their life and, and, and they don't consciously decide to put those things in. There was a, a track that used to go around, it was called the tyranny of the urgent. And in that tract, it, it talked about how when Jesus died on the cross, not everyone was fed, not everyone was healed, and not everyone was saved. But at the end of his life, he was able to say, it is finished. Even though not everyone was saved, not every, everyone was healed, not everyone was fed, but he came to do something. He got that accomplished, but, and he was able to say, it is finished. He knew what his life was about, and knowing what your life is about also helps you know what your life is not about. In life, what we find is that it's, it's the urgent things, the unimportant things that scream the loudest when they're first ignored. The important things, the big rocks in our life, don't typically scream the loudest when they're first ignored. So you get that business phone call and you constantly go to that and it's urgent 
And then at the same time, you ignore your family, but your family doesn't scream the loudest when you first ignore them. But over time, if you live that way, you're going to find that that big rock is never put in and it's gonna create a great deal of problems. So when we, when we think about this coming year and the big rocks, the important things, there in your outline. In 2023, when I set priorities, we're gonna call those the big rocks, it doesn't mean that I do more, it just means that I do more of what matters most, what matters most. Again, at the end of Jesus' ministry, not everyone was healed, not everyone was saved, not everyone was fed, but he said, it is finished. So from last week, we were in Ephesians chapter four, Ephesians chapter five, and we read verses 15 through 17. I put that there on your outline from the Phillips translation, which is my favorite translation on this verse. There on your outline, it says, Paul says, live life then with a due sense of responsibility, not as men who do not know the meaning of life, but as those who do. Make the best use of your time. Don't be vague, but grasp firmly what you know to be the will of the Lord. Um, used to be a man that I listened to. His name was Zig Ziglar. How many of you remember Zig Ziglar? Absolutely. Awesome. And he would say, you want to be a meaningful, specific, not a wandering generality. A meaningful, specific, not a wandering generality. So when I read making the most of my time, I would paraphrase that by saying, that means you put the big rocks in first. Put the big rocks in first if you're gonna make the most of your time. Now in my life, like, like your life, I realize that I can't do everything. So I'm gonna have to decide what's most important and make sure that that gets in first. And that's gonna, the goal of life is to have a, a, a life that is a, well-lived life. And the way that you do that is you make sure that the important things are the things that go in first. So again, when I come to the end of the year, I begin to evaluate. I look back over the last year and I ask myself, did I put the important things in or, or did those things drift? And then as I come to the new year, I wanna make sure that I'm putting the important things, the big rocks in my life to make sure that that gets done, not just the urgent things. So I wanna share a couple of lessons that I've learned along the way, lessons that I'm still learning. And it's not like you learn it and then it's done. It's something that we're gonna be constantly learning. The lessons that I've learned come from people who've done it right. And I've also learned from people who, if they had the opportunity to do it over, they would do it different. And so I've learned from, from both. One of the lessons that I learned when we first moved here um, uh, we began the church. There was another pastor in town and they had started a few years before us and they were meeting at Jupiter Farms Elementary. And the pastor of that church had been around longer than just about anybody in town. And uh, so he was sort of the Obi-Wan Kenobi of the pastors. And so we, we, would, we would meet with him and he, he was just a, a great guy, great guy. And so about once a month, he and I would get together and have lunch. And I, I was new at this, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm learning. And, and um, so this one month, we're supposed to have lunch. And about an hour before we're supposed to meet, I get a phone call. And uh, he's, it's him. And he says, Dan, can we, can, we, can we reschedule lunch? I go, absolutely. Well, then he goes into his story. And he says, you know, Dan, I've been in the ministry for over 20 years. And he says, I was so committed to the ministry he said, anytime somebody called, in any time there, there was a need, I left. I took the call and I went. I was there all the time when they needed me and I thought I was being a good pastor. He says, but here's what happened. I completely lost my relationship with my daughter. And uh, now she's at PBA and she hasn't spoken to me in about a year. And she's just called me out of the blue and said, will you go scuba diving with me? And he said, yes. He said, we can we reschedule? I'm like, absolutely. And as he was telling that story inside, I was like, learn, learn, learn. Because he did the urgent thing, but he lost one of the biggest rocks in his life. And, and sadly, for, for many people who weren't even at his church anymore. And so he had learned that. And I wanted to learn that, that, that lesson. So um, you will remember just to go one step further, if you went to college, um, you took Psychology 101, 
And if you did, you'll remember Erickson's eight stages of psychosocial development. Now, how many of you remembered that? Just put your hand up like, like you remember. It doesn't matter. They're all friends. But, but if you took that, you'll at least remember the name, but you might not remember all the eight stages. But uh, what was interesting in that is you come to the end of your life and you're in the eighth stage of the psychosocial development. And that stage is called integrity versus despair. Integrity versus despair. And that's where we, we look back over our lives and we ask, did I live a meaningful life? Did, did my life actually have meaning? And, and my hope is that for all of us, that as we look back over our lives, we're able to say, yes, I lived a meaningful life. But that comes, that comes from deciding up front what the important things are, the big rocks in our life, and making sure that those things go in first. So I have six big rocks in my life. And uh, today I'm gonna talk about my big three, and uh, they might be slightly different than, than yours or how it works out for you. I can't share everything about them, but I, I wanna share enough thoughts to give you something to think about, evaluate the last year, and then think about the next year as we go forward. So my, my first big rock, and is, um, write this down, is gonna be my relationship with God. It's my relationship with God. I, I've decided that if nothing else gets done, that's gonna get done, that, that's going to happen. And as Christians, we believe that Jesus is God. We would say, God, the Son of God. So there's this great story when Jesus was on the earth, we would say, God's earthly ministry, God was on the earth. And in this story, Jesus is having dinner with some friends. The, the man's name is Lazarus, and he has two sisters, Mary and Martha. And you all know the story. I'm gonna read it, and then I just underline a few things, and then we'll, we'll talk about it. But Martha, there, again, it's a dinner party. Martha had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she, she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the, Lord's, the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are so worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing, one thing is necessary, and for Mary has chosen the good part, the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So the, the, the first thing that we, we learn in this little interchange there in your outline is that Martha was busy, and, but it left her worried and bothered about so many things, so many things. And Jesus says, Martha, there's really only one thing that, that's necessary. But Ma Martha wasn't bad. Uh, she was a believer, but she just never got around to deciding what the big rock was going to be in her life. So Jesus, apparently, Jesus thinks that the big rock is sitting at his feet, listening to his word. And he says, that's the only thing that's really necessary. I would say it's, it's certainly the, the most important thing. And you notice the result. Martha's distracted, she's worried, she's bothered. It says, by so many things. Mary, on the other hand, doesn't seem to be bothered or worried or, or distracted. She's listening to his word, listening to his word, which is the, the, the big rock that she had chosen. Now, when I see Mary, and she's not bothered, uh, distracted, you know, all, by so many things, it reminds me of one of my life verses. And this is a, a verse you want to make a memory verse for you. And it's Psalm 119, 165, and here's what it says. It says, great peace, great peace have they which love thy law. We would say God's word. They love God's word. And nothing shall offend them. Nothing shall offend them. Now, when it says great peace, would you say that we live in a world where people are really just stressed out? Yes. What about this? Have, this is probably crazy for me to even bring up, but uh, it says that, that nothing will offend them. Would you say that we live in a world where there are some people who are offended about everything all the time? They're just constantly, they wake up offended, they go to bed offended, they're just offended. 
and, and uh, which you understand in the world, but it's sad when it's believers. It's, it's sad when it's believers, but there's something about his word that brings great peace. I pastored in Ohio. This is not part of my notes, so I'm entering into dangerous territory here. But, but people would just call the church and they'd be so stressed out. I gotta talk to somebody right now. And we'd say, listen, we can't meet with you right now. Go spend time, read your Bible for an hour, give us a call back. They call us back. No, I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing better. I got, I got peace. There's something about God's word that just brings peace, brings peace. So if you ever meet a believer like Martha, who's worried, bothered, distracted, easily offended, uh, the antidote is his word. When I meet somebody like that, I know they're not spending time in his word. And, and so Jesus says only one thing is necessary. And this is the part that many people miss. Write this down. Mary's big rock was sitting at the Lord's feet listening. And Jesus tells us that Mary chose the good part, the good part. She sat at his feet listening to his word. She had peace. Martha was a believer. She wasn't bad, but she was just stressed. Listening to his word, sitting at his feet was not her priority. You know, the interesting thing or the good thing is that they had to wait for Jesus to show up at a, at a dinner party for them to sit at his feet and listen to his word. But you and I have his word and we can sit at his feet every day in his word and let that word have its effect in our life. So here's, here's how it works out for me. It might be a little bit different for you, but for me, it's always the first hour of the day. The first hour of the day is, is my time with the Lord. Sometimes it's a little bit longer, but, but I will, I'll begin by reading in the Bible and there are certain ways that I, I do that. Um, and then I'll begin thanking the Lord. When you thank the Lord, that's also called praising. And I'll begin thanking the Lord for the ways that he's blessed my life, even in some difficult times. I just, we just talked about the pastor in Sudan, and they don't get to do what we do. Get, going to church like this could cost them their life. And I, I begin to thank the Lord. Lord, for all the craziness in this country, thank you, Lord, that you've allowed me to be here. And thank you for the way that you've blessed my life. And I don't have to worry about those things, at least, at least not yet. And then I have a prayer list and, and I'll spend time and I go through that list. Now, I don't pray by saying, Lord, do this, Lord, do this. I, I, my prayer is more speaking to, and uh, we'll talk about that at another time. But you know, my life is like your life. And there are things that pull at me. There's things that say, you need to do this, you need to do this. But I've just decided that this is going to be my life and if something else doesn't get done, that's okay because this is going to get done. Does that make sense? So people come to Cheryl and they go, you have 12 kids, how do you do it? I mean, how do you get through the day? And you know, you, you, all, all that goes with, with 12 kids. And if you have two kids, you understand, you know, multiply by six and you, and so she'll say, well, well, I pray. And they go, yeah, yeah, I, I, I get that. But how do you get through the day? And say, well, no, this is how, this is our big rock. This is what we do. Everything comes from that. We believe that children are not parented from a book uh, but they're raised on our knees. That is, as we pray, God's working in their, their life. So that's, that is our big rock. So I, I wanna encourage you, don't be like Martha as a Christian. Be like Mary. Mary chose as her big rock, sitting at his feet, listening to his word. I wanna encourage you, if you've been going through your Christian walk, your Christian experience, and you come to church, but you're not in God's word on a daily basis, you need to begin to carve out time. I don't like to say you need to, but this is one of those times where you go, you need to. Carve out time on a daily basis. And through his spirit. You will never, you will never meet someone who has put God first in their time who would tell you through the years, I really regret that. It was a waste of time. You'll never hear that. It's been said that a Bible that's falling apart is usually owned by someone who's not falling apart. And there's a lot of truth to that. So, so how did I do this past year and what changes do I wanna make in the coming year? So my, my second big rock is, um, write this down, my relationship with Cheryl. However, I would encourage you not to write Cheryl. <laughs> but you might wanna write your spouse's, your spouse's name. So a after 26 years, Cheryl and I have learned some things about marriage. You know, when you get married, it's a, beautiful gar it's a beautiful garden. You're in love, you know, there's passion, there's beauty, and everything is great. But even though we start out 
so much in love and it's so beautiful, we've learned that if we don't carefully tend uh, to this beautiful garden, that weeds are just going to come up. Weeds are just gonna come up. For, for a garden to stay beautiful, it's going to require constant tending. And, and many people miss it in that they get married and they think it's just always going to be that way. Well, well no, it's not. It, it requires some tending. And so Cheryl and I have decided that, that uh, this is going to be our big rock because we meet couples who five, 10, 15, 20, 30, sometimes 40 years, they have been together, they wake up one day and they say, all we have is weeds. All we have is weeds. And, and, uh, and, and we look on and we realize that somebody didn't make their marriage a big rock in their life and they let it just kind of drift. And, and it wound up as a garden with a great deal of weeds. So our goal there on your outline, um, when the kids are gone, we want to still be in love. When the kids are gone, we want to still be in love. And we know that that's not gonna happen by accident. And if you were to, our family tree on both sides takes a great deal of explaining to our kids. You know, we're like, so this is the grandparent and we've got this grandparent and, the, and they were married to who? And how, how do they become grandparents? And, you know, so we have five sets of grandparents. So, you know, you do the math. So it's, it's uh, so we don't come from a very strong family background, but we realized that when we got married, we knew what we didn't want. We knew where we didn't want to wind up. But knowing what you don't want isn't the same thing as knowing what you do want. You see, driving forward, with knowing what you don't want, is sort of like driving forward with your focus in the rear view mirror. And that can create a lot of problems on the way going forward. So we had to decide what do we want. And so we've been very blessed. God has sent some great teachers in our lives. And, uh, but I wanna give you a verse. I love this passage. And uh, it comes from Proverbs and it says, let your fountain be blessed. Let your fountain be blessed. God wants to see you blessed. And rejoice in the wife of your youth. Now, did you notice after that there's a dot, dot, dot? What that means is I left the middle part of that verse out because this is church people and I'm not gonna read that. But I encourage you to look it up and you'll find out, yeah, that's really good too. So now I know you're gonna look it up. And then it says, be exhilarated always with her love. And you could turn that around, always be exhilarated with, with his love. But what you get from that is that God thought that marriage was a good thing. It was given to be a blessing, something that we rejoice in. But here's what I've learned. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen. So it, it's going to take some intentionality. So if you're here today and you look at your garden of marriage and you say, you know, there, there's just weeds everywhere. It's, it's overgrown at this point. Well, what do we do? There's this uh, great passage. We'll talk about it later on in, Ephes in Ephesians. But there's a church, the church of Ephesus, and they started out so great uh, in their relationship with, with God. As a matter of fact, Ephesus means darling. So this was his darling church. But you go a few decades in the future, by the time you get to Revelation, uh, weeds have grown up between this church that we've been studying and their relationship with the Lord. And so Jesus dictates a letter back to them. And Jesus says, I have this against you that you have left your first love. But then he says, but here's what you need to do. Repent, recognize what you've done, and then do the things that you did at first. Do the things that you did at first. So, so Jesus gives the remedy. Here's what you need to do to come back. And we'll talk about that when we get there. But when Cheryl and I were dating, most of our dating life was, was taking walks. It was talking. We just spent time together. And so now, we've been married for 26 years. We spend a great deal of time taking walks and talking with one another and sharing each other's lives. We, we've never stopped doing the things that, that we did at first because we don't want our garden of marriage to turn into a weed garden. So you wanna put that big rock in and that's the decision that we've made and like we say, uh, things pull at our life just like they pull at your life but we've decided that this is going to be our big rock. Well, going on, um, some of you here today, you're single and you say, well, how, do I, how does that apply to me? I'm single. I, I wanna I want give you a verse and this verse, whether you're single, you're in high school, you're in college or 
you've been married and now you're divorced. You're divorced. Um, I wish somebody would have told me about this verse when I was a young teenager because I think it could have altered the course of my life. It comes from the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs 31, 12, it says, and this is for all the singles, she does him good and not evil, and you wanna underline, all the days of her life, all the days of her life. Now you can change that and say, he does her good all the days of his life. Did you notice it didn't say when they get married? It says all the days of her life, all the days of his life. You see, I grew up in an environment that said when you get married, you're gonna be good and faithful to your spouse all the days of your life. And we all get that. But that's not what it says. It says that we're good to our future spouse, we're good to our spouse all the days of our life. And so, so what does that mean? Well, if you're going to be good to your future spouse, um, you know, if, if you're divorced at this point, there's a good chance you're probably gonna get married uh, in the future. So we can't go back, but we can say at this point here, from this point on, I'm going to be good to my future spouse all the days of my life. So one of the ways that you can be good to your future spouse is say that I'm gonna be good to my future spouse all the days of my life with my morality. And, and if you do that, I want you to know that your future spouse will be so grateful that you were good to them even before you married them. They will be grateful for that. You, you can be good to your future spouse all the days of your life by thinking about what do you need to know to be married? You know, it, it, somebody's gotta do laundry and cooking and manage the checkbook and, and all of those things. Those are great skills. You know, be good to your spouse all the day. Learn the things that you need to know men and women for, for when you're, you're married. Be good to your spouse all the days of your life. Does that make sense? Yes. And sadly, I wish somebody would have told me that when I was a young teenager because I think my life would have been different. Well, so I have to ask myself, how did I do this year in that area? You know, did, did, am I closer to my spouse? Is our garden still a beautiful garden in our marriage or have some weeds come up? And if weeds are coming up, what do I need to do to, to begin to change that? Let this be a big rock. Let this be a big rock in your life. If you're single here today and you say, you know, I haven't been good to uh, my spouse all the days of my life because I don't know my spouse, then decide today. Say, I'm, I'm going to honor the Lord and I'm going to honor my future spouse and I'm gonna be good to them from this day on and let the Lord work in your, in your relationships, let the Lord work together to bring you the, the person who's gonna be so grateful that you honored them even when you weren't married to them. So that's my second big rock. Now my third big rock is my relationship with my family. Specifically, this is my relationship with my kids, my children. As you, as you, you know, we have 12 children in our family and it's been an amazing journey. And uh, I've learned uh, firsthand that they really do grow up so fast. Anybody else learn that lesson? Yeah, it, it happens so fast. So moms, if you got that toddler running around and you're going, how long? Oh, there'll, there'll come a day then, then you'll wish for, for those, those days back. It happens very fast. So in, in our family, when we think about our, our children, if you look at Cheryl's family of origin and my family of origin, growing up, we have in our respective families almost no good shared memories whatsoever. So we have very little connection with the rest of our, rest of our family. So my sister calls me probably twice a year and she'll always say something like this. Do you know the only time we ever talk is when there's a crisis in the family and we have to fix it? It's the only time that we talk. And the reason being is we had no common shared good memories when we were kids. Uh, we, we lived in the same house, but there was no family unit to speak of, so to speak. My uh, Cheryl, on her side of the family, there's no uh, bond with the brothers and, and her, her brother and sister in, in, in that our kids have first cousins that they've never met first cousins they've never met. So there's like no connection whatsoever. And nobody's saying, we need to get everybody together. And that came from how they did family all those years ago so that when they grew up, they're just like, we have, we have no connection. We, we don't keep in, in touch at all. So we see families where the kids grow up 
kids turned 18 and whatever was going on in the family, they go, I'm just done. I'm done with this. And, and off they go. And sometimes it takes years to come back and repair the relationship. So in our family, our goal, write this down, is when our kids grow up, they would still want to be with us and with each other. They'd still want to be with us and with each other. So we've been intentional in our family uh, to, to make sure that they have those common shared memories growing up. So, so we've made some decisions. As our kids were growing up, we always went camping. We always went camping. And uh, we bought a pontoon boat. And if this church thing ever ends, I'm gonna sell campers and pontoon boats because you need them, because they are awesome. And, uh, and, and then we all, we, we all got our black belts together. And, and you know, so that was, that was kind of a cool thing. But you know what I've never done with my kids, not one time ever, is I've never taken them to Disney. I never took them. And uh, part of the reason is because we realized that we could camp and go boating all year for less than what it would cost to take my family of 12 kids to Disney for, for a full week. You know, so, so we've never done that. Now, there's another reason. I am a crazy conspiracy theorist. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a crazy conspiracy theorist. So there are reasons why I've never gone to Disney. So, um, but that's a story for another day. So... As a conspiracy theorist, my motto is, just because you're not paranoid, doesn't mean they're not out to get you. <laughs> so we've, we've wanted to be intentional about share, creating those shared memories. Now, we don't always get it right, we don't always get it right, but, but uh, we've been intentional. Now, in this big rock with our kids, we, we came from a certain type of church uh, family background, so we've had to learn some things along the way about parenting. And I think the, the greatest lesson that we have learned about parenting and being family, and please write this down, is that we always have to remember that they're the kids and I'm the adult. They're the kids and I'm the adult. So, so um, there was this one time we went to on vacation and uh, we, we were creating all of these shared, you know, connections and, and all of that. We spent a truckload of money. We did this and we did that and we did this and here, there and everywhere. And uh, then we'd, we'd done it all. And then it was time to start going home, but they wanted to do more. And they started saying, but, but you never do anything with us. And we'd spend, now, am I the only person who's had that experience? <laughs> yeah, you never do anything. It's like, I just spent like more than I had. Let me just say that, more than I had to do that. And so um, Cheryl was so frustrated, you know, because they're responding that way. They were little at the time. And so she calls. Now, what you don't know is when I was 13, I moved in with another family. And that family became my, my family. And so um, Cheryl calls the mom of, of my family. And her name is Marie. And uh, she said, Marie, I'm just so frustrated. I've, we've done all of this. We spent all this money. We're taking it. And they're, we never do anything. And... <laughs> And Marie laughed and she said, <laughs> Cheryl, don't you know what the Bible says? Don't you know what the Bible says? And she gave us the single best parenting verse in the whole Bible. And it wasn't even meant to talk about parenting. Paul the apostle is speaking in 1 Corinthians 13. And here's what he says. He says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish things away. <laughs> do you know why your kids do those crazy, stupid things that just annoy you? You wanna know why? Because they're kids. <laughs> and, and that's how they think. That's how they think. So quick story. Um, in our family, uh, Avery Joy is now 16 years of age. When Avery was five years of age, she was learning how to write her name. We, we always homeschooled back, back in those days. And um, so we had this black suburban and uh, Avery learned how to spell her name. And so she goes outside to my black suburban and I don't know if it was a rock or a screwdriver or what, but she carved her name. You can just, and it was down to the metal and then a little bit further in on that. She was so proud, but here's the thing. She spelled her name, she wrote it out, but she wrote it out backwards. So. 
So I come home and I, am, I see this, you know, she's, she's written her name, it's all backwards and I'm just, I'm livid, I'm livid. And, and I'm like, Avery Joy poured. That's when you know that you're really in trouble. You get all three names. Avery Joy Lord, what have you done? And I'm like, Avery Joy, you know, you're, you're already homeschooled, so everybody thinks you're unsocialized, and now you wrote your name backwards, so they're all gonna think, I can't even teach you which way to write your name. <laughs> Left to right, get it right. Well, that's not really how I handled that situation, but <laughs> I don't always get it right. But you know what I'm glad about? I'm glad I learned the verse that they're, they're children because it made perfect sense to her. And here's why, here's why. Um, on that day, I chose my relationship with my daughter over the car that I don't even have anymore. I still have her, but I don't have that car. But she thought like a child, and we still see that car driving around every once in a while. <laughs> we used to have that car. It's still going, by the way, so. no. So, so, so Cheryl and I have learned that if we use anger, and some people use hysterical anger, they can get results from their kids right now. But when you do that, you are destroying your future relationship with your children. It destroys it, absolutely destroys it. So the question that we ask ourselves and our family as we think through, if we do family like this, what will it look like in 20 years? What will it look like in 20 years? Because we, we want to do family in such a way that they want to come see us and be with each other when they don't have to, when they don't have to in 20 years. Again, we don't always get it right. You're not always going to get it right, but we want to be intentional. So I, I, I look on and I say, so how did I do this year in my relationship with the Lord? How, how did I do in my relationship with, with my spouse? And, and how did I do in my relationship with my children? Are there deeper bonds now? Or are we separating in, in relationship? And what can I do in the coming year to first of all decide what my big rocks are and then decide to put those in first? Now when you put those in first, you're going to find that there's going to be those who will, uh, they'll be hostile that you're doing it because they want you to respond to the urgent. But if you're gonna have a life that's well lived, you gotta put the big things in first. There at the end of your, well, let me just give you quick um, the areas of big rocks that you can think through. Spiritual, relationships, intellectual, physical, career, financial. Those are the things that you want to think through. But at the end of our life, we're going to stand before the Lord. And this is what I want to hear from my life there in your outline. His Lord said unto him, well done, good and faithful servant. And that comes from putting the big things, the important things in first not giving your life to the urgent things that won't be there in several years. Did you find that interesting today? Yes. Good, good, good. Yes. Take this and think it through. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father, thank you so much uh, for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for how practical Ephesians has become. And uh, Lord, help us to go forward with a, a life that's intentional not a life that just responds to the urgent all the time. Help us, Lord, to discern what our big rocks are going to be and help us decide how we're going to put those in first and live it out. I pray, God, that you keep us till we meet again. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you guys.